There's a thing. Uh, okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first order of business, can I get a vice president to volunteer to take minutes for us tonight? Either here or through the Zoom audience. Thank you, Jim. Jim just volunteered. And we have a live appearance by Jim. It's really nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so with that, you have found your way into the University of Overall Astronomers monthly meeting, first one of 2023. And as you know, we uh, have our guest speakers speak first, and then we do a business meeting afterwards. And we do have a number of business things to discuss. So, but you know, if people want to leave and not participate in that, we might understand that. So, and we're starting out the year really well because we have one of our favorite repeat speakers that we've had in this club. Uh, we do have a number of them that are like world class famous people, and Brother Guy is certainly one of those. He's actually one of my personal favorite people on the planet, to be honest with you. And I think in a little bit, if you aren't familiar, if I haven't seen him before, you might start to understand why. So, uh, but brother uh, Guy Consolmagno is actually from the Detroit area. Uh, he decided that he could become a Jesuit and sort of answer his calling and yet be a professional astronomer at the same time. When we first met him, he was a uh, astronomer for the Vatican Observatory, but has since become the director of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. So you can only guess who his boss is now. <laughs> so uh, we've had him talk about a number of uh, subjects approximately every couple of years, and he's back with us again. And tonight he's gonna talk to us about the uh, uh, asteroid Bennu. And as you might remember, we launched a mission to Bennu not long ago. In fact, that mission called OSIRIS-REx is actually currently bringing back samples uh, still on its way back to us. And it was surprising that when OSIRIS-REx took a look at the surface of Bennu, it kind of didn't make sense. It was covered with boulders, but yet it absorbs light or uh, heat like a powder. So what's going on and how did it get that way? Being the brother guy is a world expert on asteroids. He's gonna to attempt to explain that to us tonight and you might find the answer rather surprising. So you've heard enough of me. Let's bring on Brother Guy. Thank you, Brother Guy. Great to be with you guys. I uh, want to let you know when I first signed on for this, I was expecting to be in North America, but my travel plans changed. And so right now I am in Albano, outside of Rome in the Vatican Observatory headquarters. That's part of our library behind me there. That's the uh, French journal whose name I cannot pronounce because I don't speak French. Um, just to let you know what the weather looks like. It's cloudy, of course, even though it's two in the morning. And don't be too impressed by the five degrees. Of course, we're talking Celsius. So it's actually very Michigan-like, you know, in the upper 30s and cloudy. What I want to talk about today, though, is stuff you can do even if you have a cloudy night because it involves spacecraft and it involves meteorites in your uh, in, in, in your own laboratory. Um, the Japanese and the Americans both went to dark kinds of asteroids, and the two asteroids, Ryugu and Bennu, look very similar, except if you really do it to scale, Bennu is a whole lot smaller. The crazy thing is, for people, people are not familiar, is the odd shape. But in fact, this is a fairly common shape among asteroids. It looks like a shop, a, a top or a dreidel, or I don't know what you would quite call it. And um, the pictures here, two of them are radar pictures. One is a Goldstone uh, image of an asteroid 2017 BQ6, which is a little bit smaller than a kilometer across. And then the other is actually a comet, a Jupiter family comet, uh, P2016 BA14, again, about a kilometer across. And then this other diamond-shaped thing is asteroid Steins, which actually has a name. Uh, it was seen by the Rosetta spacecraft on its way to uh, the comet with the very, very long name that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, even though one of the guys it's named for is somebody that I uh, co-authored a paper with once. I can't pronounce the name. The shape 
is thought to arise from the fact that you've got loose material in a very, very rapidly spinning asteroid. Now, there are some arguments that maybe this doesn't exactly work the way that the model says for Bennu, but certainly the idea is if it's spinning really fast, the material is dragged down to the equator, which is moving the fastest. And if it spins a little bit faster, then the stuff gets flown off, flung off, and that reduces the angular momentum and it keeps the spin at a certain speed. One of the really interesting things that happens with small asteroids is something called the Yarkovsky effect. And if you've been playing with asteroids, you've heard this before, but even if you've heard the term Yarkovsky effect, and I'll describe a little bit what it is, the history may not be familiar to you. It was first described more than 100 years ago in a particularly obscure Russian pamphlet by a guy named Yarkovsky. Now, there is a scientist named Ernst Erpik, and uh, he was very big in, in comets around 1950. And he described having seen this document around 1910. And in 1951, he was trying to recreate from memory what he remembered reading 40 years earlier because he couldn't find the document. And the story goes, there were two effects that might shift a, a, a small body in its orbit. Uh, one of them was if the body was slowed down by drag moving through the ether. Since we don't have an ether anymore, we know there isn't such an ether. You don't have to worry about that Yarkovsky effect. <laughs> um, we'll get to what the other one is in a second, but I just want to finish with the history of it. In the 1970s, I was an undergraduate and then a master's student at MIT. And one of the other grad students working with a guy named John Lewis had come across the Erpik paper describing a paper he remembered reading. And so he went back and worked out, this guy was named Charlie Peterson. And so he published three or four papers on the Yarkovsky effect. And then he'd been in the Peace Corps, he decided to get his doctorate and go back to Thailand. So he stopped publishing papers and it sat there for another 20 years, nobody doing anything about it. Finally, in the late 1980s, it was rediscovered for the fourth time. And uh, finally, the work was, was entered into common understanding. The idea is simple. If you've got an asteroid that's spinning and it's in sunlight, the sunlight is heating up the sunlit side, but the afternoon is going to be warmer than the morning if there is any kind of thermal inertia. If you know it, it, it takes a little bit of time to heat up the body, it takes a little bit of time to, to let the, the heat escape, that's thermal inertia. So if the afternoon side is hotter than the morning side, then it gets rid of its heat by emitting uh, infrared photons. But the photons on one side are going to be slightly more energetic because they're hotter than the photons on the other side. And that's going to give a push. Uh, against you know, the afternoon side in the direction of the morning side, and that extra push will change the orbit of the asteroid. As you can imagine, this is a really tiny effect. But if you've got a small enough body and it's sitting in space for a really long time, it can gradually move it one way or the other, depending on which way it's spinning until it actually falls into a resonance with the orbit of Jupiter, and then all bets are off. So this is how you slowly move things in and out of uh, the asteroid belt. The other thing that is a a connected to it is the YORP effect, where YORP stands for Yarkovsky, O'Keefe, Radzivsky, Paddock. And not only can you move the asteroid, but you can change the rate at which it spins. So again, this is sort of what would be spinning up these you know, top-shaped piles of rubble that we think these small asteroids, we've seen these small asteroids are. Let's compare those top-shaped asteroids to this guy. This is asteroid Itakawa, and it was visited by the Hayabusa 1 spacecraft, oh, more than 15 years ago now, 2005. And it brought back from dust, some dust from the surface and we know from the dust that it's an ordinary chondrite, and it looks really, really different. Again, it's still less than a kilometer. 
But notice two things. First of all, it's not top shaped. Secondly, there are big regions of sand that seem to be covering part of the surface. One of the reasons it looks different from uh, these top shaped things could well be the fact that it's made out of different stuff. Basically, there are two kinds of asteroids that make up 90% of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, roughly called S-class because they look like stony meteorites and C-class because they look like carbonaceous meteorites. And the different kinds of material in the meteorites could be one of the reasons why they have different sized and shaped and, and composition sorts of asteroids. Now, for those of you who don't know meteorites, meteorites are classified by what they're made out of. They're stones or they're irons or they're stony irons. And you go to a museum and half of them are irons, but that's only because irons are really easy to find. Stony meteorites fall apart when they get you know, wet and they start to rust. So irons last forever and stony meteorites you better pick up pretty quickly. Of the stony meteorites, the most common one are primitive and the most common primitive ones are either carbonaceous or ordinary. So ordinary, ordinary meteorites, that's basically uh, rocks made out of olivine and pyroxene and plagioclase and flux of iron all kind of mushed together. And they're chondrules because they have little round balls called chondrites. One other thing to warn you, though, about this classification, carbonaceous chondrites. So you think they're chondrites because they're going to have little balls of, of material. Those are chondrules. And carbonaceous because they're rich in carbon. Ha! Think again. <laughs> it turns out that the name is a horrible misnomer. Most carbonaceous chondrites don't have much carbon. And those that do have a lot of carbon often don't have chondrules. So it's, it's, I'm rem reminded of somebody trying to tell me that T. Tauri, the star, is no longer considered a T. Tauri star because all the other stars that are now considered T. Tauri stars are different from T. Tauri. <laughs> Life is like that. <laughs> um, there are a few carbonaceous chondrites like Orgay that may be 5% carbon and 20% OH that you know is sort of rich in water. But all of the other ones, including famous ones like Allende, really just have a tiny fraction. The reason that Allende and these other ones are dark is not because they have carbon in them, but because they've got magnetite. And I'll just, I can go on for meteorites forever. This is you know my thing. <laughs> I've got a lab at the Vatican where uh, I work on meteorites. And we bring in, you know, visiting scientists. This was a chemist who came to us hey, from Kathleen. Argentina. And, and uh, that kept, can you hear me? Yeah, that chemist Kathleen. from Argentina. He, uh, he brought his own white lab coat, which I thought was very nice of him. <laughs> um, and he's looking at a meteorite that comes from, uh, from Argentina, in fact. The work that we do in that lab is measuring physical properties. So the first is density. Density is the mass divided by the volume and the porosity, how much of the rock is actually filled with pore spaces. So porosity is, you, you measure two different kinds of densities. Mass is mass, you put it on a scale. What's the volume? Is it the volume of the outer piece of the rock? That would be the bulk volume. Or is it the volume only of the bits of rock that are actually rock and not counting the volume of the pore spaces? And that's the grain density. And if you could measure those two densities, the difference tells you the porosity. So how do you measure um, these sorts of things? Measuring the grain density, you actually use a gas because the, it, here's how it works. We've got you know, two containers. You put the rock in one container, you put it in a plug, you pressurize the one container to maybe two atmospheres, the other container to one atmosphere. You measure the pressures very carefully. You open the valve between them. The, the gases equalize out. The bigger the volume of the rock, the higher the final pressure. And you can turn that pressure into a volume if you've got some objects like perfect spheres of known volume that you can calibrate against. So you can see we had a collection of calibration spheres, which are carefully color-coded and numbered 1 to 15 solids and stripes. 
very useful calibration spheres. In fact, you can buy commercial gizmos that work on smaller samples. We wound up getting one of those. And we've even built one that works on slabs. And that was in our lab right next to where the Pope was. The bulk measurements are a lot harder because you need a fluid, unlike the gas that'll go into all the cracks, you need a fluid that won't go into any of the cracks. You can't use water. Water will you know, damage the meteorite. I was having cappuccino one day at our cappuccino machine at the Vatican Observatory and pouring sugar into the cup. I realized, ha, ah, powders will work just great. So we don't actually use sugar. We started out using white beads. And that worked for about 20 years until finally laser scanners got to be good enough. And Bob Mackey, who had been doing the work on beads, got himself a laser scanner and a couple of minions to help out. And now we just you know, scan and measure in the computer the volume, the outer volume of the meteorite. And here's our result. For the bulk volume, most stony meteorites are anywhere from 2.8 to 3.6 times the density of water. But the wet carbonaceous meteorites are much lower density. Meanwhile, the grain densities, uh, again, the wet carbonaceous meteorites are much lower densities. And when you compare the two, you find the porosity of most of these is around 5 to 8%. 5 to 8% of the volume of the rock is pore space, except for the wet guys, which can be much higher, anywhere from 10 to 25% uh, empty space. This is uh, the Allende meteorite. It's 25% empty space, even though it looks like a big solid rock which is kind of interesting to note. Where does the pore space live inside a rock? For most rocks, you can do a, a, a correlation between looking at a thin section and counting up the, the, the cracks and how much of a rock is cracked versus the porosity we actually measure. Uh, this is what a typical meteorite looks like when you look at it in a scanning electron microscope. The pore space is not because the grains aren't compressed enough. They're, in fact, the grains are beautifully compressed. It's just that some shock wave came through, and the pressure wave then, as it passed, became an unpressure wave, and that opens up cracks in the rocks. Except for the wet carbonaceous chondrites. So that was the work that we had done before, and I've ever even given a talk here about that stuff. What about other physical properties? How does this rock behave when you expose it to heat? What is its ability to hold on to heat? How much heat comes off as it cools down? How do you measure the heat capacity? Well, um, I had this very clever uh, Dewar, it's actually a Buzz Lightyear sippy cup. You fill it with liquid nitrogen. The nitrogen boils away slowly. Then you drop in the rock and it boils like mad. So the, the, the weight of the rock, jump, the, the system jumps up. And then as the rock cools down, that much extra nitrogen boils away, the, the thing in red. You measure the amount of nitrogen boiled away to cool the rock off. You know how much heat it takes to boil one gram of liquid nitrogen. You know how much heat comes out of the rock. That's a really cool and quick and dirty way. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do the same easy way of doing things for measuring thermal conductivity. So for that, um, I was visiting a fellow Jesuit, a guy who teaches uh, physics at Boston College, and he's interested in solid state physics. And he had this million dollar machine that he'd gotten a grant for that measures interesting materials in their various properties that I don't even know the names of that solid state physicists are interested in. One of them is conductivity. And I go, oh, oh, can you measure the conductivity of some of our meteorites? So he's been doing this now for about eight years. And uh, the, the, the picture in the center shows the setup. You've got a, a, a lump of meteorite that's been cut. Too bad it's been cut. It's small, which means that if the meteorite is not homogeneous, that's a problem. 
We've got a penny there by comparison. Whoever processed the picture didn't realize that that's a 1943 penny. It's not supposed to be copper colored. It's actually a steel penny so that you don't introduce copper into the, uh, into the rock by being too close to it. It sends a pulse, but you can do these measurements pulse by pulse by pulse of heat. As the material is held in a vacuum and lowered in temperature from room temperature down to five degrees Kelvin, just above absolute zero. And after we did a bunch of these measurements, we went even further and he got a gizmo to fit into his machine that would measure the heat capacity step by step by step all the way down to absolute zero or close to. So our big rock dumping into the liquid nitrogen gives you an idea of the average heat capacity. This shows you the heat capacity and how it changes with temperature. So we started doing this on a bunch of meteorites and we looked in particular at the CM class meteorites. They're wet carbonaceous meteorites not quite as wet as the, the uh, CIs, but, but pretty good. And by their spectra, they look to be similar to what the spectra of Bennu looked like. When we went to Bennu, one of the reasons that they chose Bennu as a place to send the spacecraft was that it was dark. And it had, even in the darkness, it had spectra that told you that it was rich in water. And it looked an awful lot, not all that dissimilar to CM meteorites. So you've got olivine and pyroxene, but a lot of these hydrophilosilicates that make up the matrix of the meteorite. And in our first work, we measured five of these. We've gone back and measured a few more, and the, the results are all the same. So we measured the density. We know how to do that. We uh, measured the porosity. We showed you how to do that. These are pretty porous, anywhere from 15 to 25% porous. And the ones we're measuring are pretty small, which is why you know you want to take a lot of measurements and look at a lot of different ones to make sure that you're not just seeing some unusual result. Here's what you get for conductivity of meteorites. Now, these are all the meteorites. That purple line at the bottom called Bockeveld, that was the only CM we had measured the first time 10 years ago we went around making these measurements. I want you to look at that green curve, the one that zooms way up and then swoops down. That's how conductivity of heat works in a rock at really low temperatures, like 50 to 100 Kelvin. 50 to, you know, you know just not all that, that you know, cold, really cold, down to absolute zero kind of cold. You get heat moving through a rock by packets of vibrations called phonons. And the more heat you have, the higher the temperature of the rock, the more phonons you generate, so you can conduct more and more and more until you reach a peak, and suddenly you've got enough phonons that they run into each other and start to interfere with each other, and that limits how well the phonons can move, and the more phonons you get, the more they interfere, and that's when you get that slope downwards. None of the other meteorites look like that. None of the other meteorites, are, they've got that you know, rise up at the beginning, more phonons, but they never get that high peak. They're, you know, a factor of four or lower than what you'd expect because it's not phonons that's interrupting the flow of heat. It's all of those cracks. You know, you've got a, a packet of waves that are just, you know, the, the, the atoms in the, in the meteorite vibrating away and passing on what's really a sound wave or close to a sound wave, similar to a sound wave. And then it runs into a crack and it can't propagate. It's got to figure out a way to get around the crack before it can conduct anymore. And that means that the cracks are limiting the co thermal conductivity. What you would expect for heat capacity is that heat capacity is very low at low temperatures and rises up in a very kind of general curve that you see over and over and over again. And you would expect that cracks have nothing to do with it. It's just how much can the, um, the molecules in the minerals vibrate in, among themselves. That's where they're holding onto the heat, their internal vibrations. But 
I told you the guy I'm working with at Boston College, Sio Peel, he's a solid state physics kind of guy. And what looked like perfectly, you know, smooth curves to me on the left, when you look at them in really high detail in a certain region, see if uh, just at that particular temperature range, right through there at very, very high resolution, the dots are the difference, the, the derivative of the curve. So you can see it's not all that smooth. And there is something funky going on at around 200 Kelvin. Maybe kind of, you know, the one phase of a mineral is slightly shifting to a different phase. Who knows? The point of all of it, though, is that from the conductivity and the heat capacity and the density, you can calculate the thermal inertia. Remember thermal inertia? That's what allowed us to have the Yorp effect and the Yarkovsky effect. And not only that, you can measure it directly on an asteroid by seeing the temperature on one side of the asteroid versus the temperature on the other side of the asteroid if you've got a spacecraft at the asteroid that can see the two different sides, or you've got a way of doing this very cleverly from Earth. What we have found over and over and over again is that the thermal inertia, the amount of, of the, the ability of the, the rock to hold on to its heat, is an order of magnitude more than the thermal inertia of the rock that the meteorite is made out of. And that means that the conductivity really is much lower than the conductivity of the rock. Why would that be? Oh, it's the surface of an asteroid. It's being beat up by micro meteorites, bits of cosmic dust churning it up and making the upper centimeter very fluffy, very dusty. The numbers we got for Bennu weren't quite so bad. But still, Bennu had more inertia in, in the way it could hold on to heat than the CM meteorites that we measured. And it's okay. Kind of what you expected. Okay. Sio Peel has got this machine. He works in solid state. And he says, I'm going to make another measurement. I'm going to measure what is its thermal expansion as it heats up. And if you'd asked me, I'd have told him, Sai, that's a waste of time. Nobody's interested in that. You're not going to learn anything interesting. It's going to, you know, warms up. It's going to get a little bit bigger by some incredibly tiny fraction that is so small that it can't possibly matter. But he goes, oh, but I know how to measure it. How are you going to measure anything that small? Well, well, you put a plate on either side of it and you measure the capacitance. You can measure that electricity, you know, the, the electrical capacitance as if it was a two-plate capacitor, and the thing moves a little bit, and it's going to you know, change the capacitance. And that can be measured really precisely. Oh, go ahead if you want to waste your time doing it. But I tell you, it's going to just get a little bit bigger when it heats up, and nothing else interesting is going to... Oops. Yeah, from zero to 150 to 200, it gets a little bit bigger. That's in parts per million, that scale on the left. And then from 200 to 250, right where we saw something maybe a little funky happening in the heat capacity, we see that as the CM meteorite warms up, it sh shrinks and it shrinks by a lot and it shrinks by a lot in a hurry. Whoa, this makes no sense. Oh, wait a minute. These are rocks that have phyllosilicates. Those are minerals that have water. And water, as it warms up, can orient itself inside the mineral. And that means that even as it gets warmer, it actually will take up less space because the water is now mobile enough that it could orient itself to take up less space. Ah, one of those, oh, I should have thought of that, but until you see the data, you never think of it. Okay, well, that's cute. So if you've got an asteroid made out of CM type material, and it's, you know, changing temperature from 200 to 250, well, wait a minute. Room temperature, the Earth is at 300 Kelvin, 270. Three, three Kelvin, 
asteroids out in the asteroid belt are at around 200 to 250 Kelvin. Especially if they're spinning, they're going to hit 250 on the daytime side and under 200 at the nighttime side. Every time one of these guys spins, which is every four hours, they're going to go through that temperature range. So it's not just that they're going to, it, it, you know, it, it shrinks when it gets warm, but it's going to go shrink, grow, shrink, grow, shrink, grow. That's interesting. This is the paper we published. And in summary, what we said was, okay, we've got the heat capacity, the thermal conductivity, the diffusivity, the inertia. They're really different from the CM meteorites than for your typical ordinary chondrites. They're really different at cold temperatures from hot temperatures. There's this really weird size change. And you might be cycling through the place that causes the size change to grow and shrink and grow and shrink. But wait, there is more. There's this problem with Bennu. One of the reasons they went to Bennu was because it was the CM dark asteroid and they wanted one that maybe would have CM material so they could bring the sample back, but they wanted to bring a sample back. So they wanted to go to one that had a low thermal inertia, which had a very fluffy surface, which meant that they could design a gizmo that would suck up dust. When they got to Bennu, even though the thermal inertia said it should be covered with dust, what they saw was a surface covered with rocks. They had to look high and low to find a place where they could actually, you know, not have the spacecraft run into a big boulder when it was trying to pick up some dust. What went wrong? Well, Ryuga was the same thing. And when the lander on Ryugu, the one on the left, hit the surface, things flew out all over the place. They're boulders, but it was clearly softer than they expected. And you could see the boulders fly when the Japanese lander landed on the surface. And the Bennu lander had a sample collector about the size of an air filter in a car engine. And it was attached to a spring. And of course, all of this has to be done remotely because you can't joystick it. It's you know 20 minutes away by light time or 10 minutes away. It's, so anyway, the spring was designed to compress. When it compressed to a certain amount, the machine would automatically stop touching the surface and back off. When they actually got to Bennu, they didn't just see rocks come out, they saw dust flying everywhere. The spring never compressed. It looked like a solid surface, but as soon as you touched it, it all fell apart. Well, the boulders in Ryugu looked to be porous, but the boulders in Bennu were really, really porous. And Bennu had a slightly different comp composition from Ryugu. So how do you explain what's going on on the surface? Remember that we had measured thermal conductivities and we had measured porosities. And we tried to see, can you make a general correlation between porosity and thermal conductivity? And the answer is, it's tough. You can kind of half close your eyes and maybe see a rough correlation. And that's not to be too surprising because the uh, heat that flows through a porous surface, the cross section of the heat that it goes through is proportional to one minus the porosity, but it's got to randomly walk around. So that's also proportional to one over the porosity. And you put the two together and you'd see that porosity should affect the amount that the heat is flowing. And roughly we saw that it goes to sort of one minus P over P. So what can we observe on an asteroid? The temperature on the surface from one side to the other. What do you infer from that? The thermal inertia. 
What can you calculate from that? The thermal conductivity. When you know the conductivity, you can then infer the porosity. And a bunch of people from the Bennu mission put together a paper that was published in Nature using our data, which is why we gave them the data so they could use that. And they found that the porosity of the rocks on Bennu and Ryugu, which is the black and the purple spot there, is way, way higher than the porosity of Itakawa, the ordinary chondrite. But then we could have told you that. Wet as, you know, meteorites are more porous than the, the ordinary rocks. And they realized that that explains the surface. If you've got a solid rock and you hit it with a micrometeorite, the micrometeorite is going to pow, splash a bunch of dust off and cover your asteroid with fields of dust and sand like Itakawa did. But if you've got a fluffy rock and a little micrometeorite comes in, the micrometeorite is just going to go right into the rock, right through the rock, not do much of anything. And the rock is going to stay looking like a rock, even though it's now become incredibly porous. Small impacts turn solid rocks into dust, but it just compacts a little bit of the ultra porous rocks. So the soft rocks keep their shape. And the porosity that you saw when we looked at the thermal inertia of Bennu wasn't due to impacts, but due to the thermal effects the fact that these th rocks are full of cracks because they're growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking. That's the theory. We do get to test the theory. There's Bob Mackey, the guy you saw from the picture 20 years ago, you know, with the with the, his, his little uh, minions. He's now on the team working with the Bennu crew, waiting for the samples to come back. And he and Sio Peel are in line to get samples to make these measurements of the stuff that comes from Bennu to see if it actually looks like the meteorites that we measured. So the answer is stay tuned. That's where we are. And I'm happy to turn it over to questions now. But uh, of course, be sure to uh, look us up at vaticanobservatory.org. I'll kill the screen sharing now. and. Uh, come up with uh, my screen. And I guess somebody there should probably uh, let me know if there are questions and maybe whoever is sharing this thing can pass questions on to me or feel free to uh, write questions in the meeting chat. But thanks for listening to my story. And you're going to have to turn the microphone on because I'm not hearing anything yet. No, we're good. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. All of these asteroids are are uh, not primordial uh, objects, correct? I don't believe that there are any primordial asteroids out there. There are some people who would argue that Ceres and Vesta might be. I give you. I gave you the talk about Vesta the last time I was there. Why I don't think it's primordial. And Ceres probably really isn't an asteroid. It's a dwarf planet. What we see are materials like iron meteorites that came from differentiated bodies that were all broken up. And what we see is that the asteroid belt has only got about a tenth of a percent of the material that it probably started with, if you can you know, judge by how much material was around to make up planets like you know, Earth and Mars. So the early solar system must have been a really violent place where whatever bodies were being formed ran into each other at high speed, maybe compressed each other, but certainly shattered each other. And then after they're shattered, they fall back together again. So all asteroids are some kind of rubble pile. some rubblier than others. Is it known uh, if it thermal effects uh, or gas uh, uh, 
uh, venting that's causing the occasional uh, explosions um, of the surface. We see the rocks just go into space on their own. The, the, the amount of gas that's left in these rocks is minuscule. Um, I don't say zero because nothing's zero anymore. And of course you do have water, but the water is actually tied up physically in the minerals. So um, the actual, you know, bursting is not due to an explosion of gas. It's actually the physical transfer of momentum or energy, uh, in, in uh, depending on what the uh, the relative speeds are, that uh, causes. You know, you've got things running into each other at several kilometers per second. That's at a speed higher than the speed of sound in the rock. So all of the kinetic energy gets turned into heat when they when they hit, and that's like. You know, I, I'm I'm tiny, almost nuclear bomb going off, so that's what causes the stuff to break apart. And oh, so uh, uh, it's just that the uh, the cameras didn't catch the inbound uh, particle uh, uh, hitting. Uh, well, bank. the impact, the impact, the inbound particle was the spacecraft itself. Oh no, no, but I mean, but before it landed, uh, there uh, they caught um, uh, videos of the uh, of. Huh. There was there was dust. There was dust, a cloud of dust around it. That was thought to be material flung off from the equator as it's spinning so quickly. Wow. Oh. Thank you. That's my understanding, at least. Brother Guy, uh, I'm Tony yeah. Licata, and I'm a Hamburg resident. Recovered. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. So recovered a couple of Hamburg meteorites. I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask the second one because you raise a second question. I'm going to ask the second one first. I want to get to the Hamburg meteorites second. Um, the the H chondrites, like the H4 Hamburg meteorite and the LL chondrites, the L chondrites, uh, are you saying in your last statement that those and those are not undifferentiated or those are not undifferentiated? They're really. Uh -huh all your thinking These, nowadays that they're all differentiated meteorites? No, no, no. I, I, thank you for asking that so I can make myself clear. Okay. The ordinary chondrites have never been thoroughly melted to the point where the iron goes in one place and the minerals go the other place. They have been slightly metamorphosed to different degrees, and that's the difference between a four and a five and a six. Okay. Um, yeah, so they've they've experienced a little bit of heat, but not so much that it would actually cause uh, the the iron to move in one direction and the uh, other material to move in the other direction. The thing that is true of these ordinary chondrites is that the crystals are very very tightly packed together. Not only in the chondrules, which are little droplets of molten rock, molten by whatever your favorite theory is for melting chondrules, and everybody's got you know at least two favorite theories. But even the dust in between the chondrules is so tightly packed together that it contributes almost nothing to the porosity. Something compressed these meteorites really, really tightly. And we're not quite sure yet what it is. Uh, the meteorites, the asteroids themselves that we see, aren't big enough for their own weight to do that. Maybe the primordial asteroids are a lot bigger and were able to do that. Or maybe the original collisions was slow enough that rather than blasting things apart, it just sort of tamped things down. But in any event, those are nice solid rocks where the only pore spaces are due to the cracks that were introduced later on. But they're not molten the way that all the iron meteorites or virtually all the iron meteorites probably do come from some differentiated bodies. Okay, so in, in the H chondrites, for example, you still would classify those as undifferentiated. So they're undifferentiated. That's, you know, the H's because they've got metallic iron, little flecks of metallic iron scattered through them. Oh, I see. All, All right. right. So high um, in iron. We could, we could yeah. go on and on on that. This, uh, the, the first yes. question I had um, regarding uh, the Hamburg meteor, we've uh, recently had a resident being from Hamburg uh, come forward with um, a new find that has been undocumented and it's actually the largest one to date. So uh, we believe it's a main mass. 
And I was over at the lab today, in fact, it's serendipitous that you're here talking today. Um, uh, but we wanted to update the bulletin on this with maybe some addendum of some sort that would, that would show that the, mm -hmm. the main mass is no longer um, 102 grams found by Robert Ward, but actually it was found by a resident on one of the lakes uh, in Hamburg Township. And it's, it, we measured it today at around uh, 138 grams. Very nice. Just under 138 grams, so it's a little bigger uh, than mm -hmm. the main mass as it's recorded on the bulletin right now. And I, th I think I heard somewhere where that you have something to do with updating the bulletins or, re or with the. I'm I'm on the committee, but okay. uh, but but I, I basically I, I'm the vice president of the Meteoritical Society, so ex officio I'm on the committee, but I abstain in all the decisions because I okay. don't have the expertise that the committee members have. All right. So the the I, I guess, guess the only point here then is to alert you to the fact that yeah, a guy by the name and of Samur Hariri is going to be submitting some. Okay. Uh, the the interesting thing, of course, up. is depending on how long it's been in the field, it could be much more weathered. That that little those little flecks of iron, you know, in Michigan's climate, they rust real fast. Oh, there's good news. Uh, they don't that. have that true coat. They don't have that true coat on them that stops the rusting. You know. No, he he found this on. January 19th, 2018. So, oh, okay. After the fall. And so, okay, that's uh, good. he's been keeping it on his mantle for five years um, and just good. didn't tell anybody about it. <clears throat> Anyhow, good. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, if I may, I want to ask more of a physics based question. Um, I can't remember the name of the process, but it's related to the thermal. Um, the difference in thermal energy due to the rotation and surface, um, I guess, shape, that can accelerate the rotation, correct? Right. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask what happens, because if it just keeps accelerating the rotation right. over millions of years, what happens when that reaches the roach limit of the asteroid? Well, when it, when it reaches the, that's when you wind up getting a, uh, a top-shaped asteroid with stuff flinging off the equator, and that then limits how fast it rotates because it gets thin any faster than that. And so that's the idea that this explains the shape of these bodies, that they've been warp spun up to their maximum rate, at which point dust flies off. And as the dust flies off, it carries off uh, angular momentum and it doesn't spin up anymore. Do you have any like theories on like, is it possible for an asteroid to completely i guess dissolve itself via this process well it could it probably would take longer than the age of the solar system but in theory i see you know. i see <laughs> okay well thank you sure questions from the since there are a lot of asteroids in the asteroid belt are they too small to observe from Earth? There, that's a really profound question. <laughs> because the asteroids are the product of collisions, there's a whole mathematical theory about how many things of a certain size do you get. If I had, you know, a, a hundred kilometer asteroid and I broke it apart due to collisions, I'd have a few big pieces, a whole lot of medium-sized peoples, and a zillion really tiny pieces. And there is a mathematical theory that guesses how this distribution of size should work out. As we are getting better at discovering asteroids, we are now getting better at finding the smaller guys. So back in the days when we didn't have CCDs, and we didn't have dedicated teams of people looking for these guys. We thought there were, you know, maybe 10,000, 50,000 asteroids. We now have more than a million asteroids because we're now seeing the smaller guys. We've also come to realize that, you know, if you're worried about an asteroid hitting the Earth and causing damage, we all think of the one that, you know, killed the dinosaurs, but that's a once in a hundred million year event. What actually is more likely to hurt somebody is something like uh, the Chernobyl event, which was what, just 10 years ago. 
And, you know, a thousand people were hurt because they saw the flash of light. They went to the window and then the windows crashed, you know, because of the sonic boom. Um, something the size of Tunguska might happen once a century or a little bit longer. Those are asteroids that are the size of, you know, a city bus. And you want to be able to see those because those could actually do some damage. But you can only see them when they're relatively close to Earth. There are now projects and, you know, space telescope missions designed to look for exactly these asteroids. So there's this entire size range from, you know, hundreds of kilometers across to dust. The dust that, you know, makes meteor showers. And there is a gap in how well we can measure things of the very size that might be interesting to know about because they could do some damage. From the room. So one more, and that's actually from me, brother guy. And it's the you talked about finding those meteorites, and I know that some of those um, events, the meteor came from the direction of the sun, so it was very difficult to um, detect. Yep. Are you aware of missions that are looking to mitigate this? There are several missions that have been proposed to do exactly that, both in Europe. And the uh, the and NASA, I am not sure that any of them have been funded yet, but they're certainly in process because everybody's well, well aware of that, you know. And a meteorite that was in a near Earth orbit, but inside, they, they, I think those are called atens, um, would do a lot of damage because it would come before we realized it was there and had any chance of mitigating or you know even shifting it apart. You have to know it's there before you can do something about, uh, you know, dodging it out of its uh, range, which is what the DART mission was testing to do. Yeah, so. I have a question you notice in the chat box there, probably the deepest one has been asked yet. <laughs> yep, I guess I'll read, I'll go ahead and read it. Are there theological complications arising from the study of an ancient Egyptian deity? That's from Kurt Hillett. Well, the, um, the the moonlet that was impacted by the DART mission, we've decided it, it, it had a name that had to do with birds, and so all the rocks are named for birds. So that's an asteroid that's for the birds. What can you say? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are asteroids called ISIS, so it is what it is. Mm. Which well, is a... Well, it took a while for people to catch that pun. I, I'm sorry. I get you. It's, it's 2.30 in the morning here. Forgive me. <laughs> I, hate, I, I hate to interrupt, but there are also uh, uh, strippers that are called ISIS. John Wallbank has entered the building. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Yes. That's okay. That yeah. kind of set us back a step. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have the Zoom audience. <laughs> Will the Webb Telescope uh, uh, give allow a more detailed uh, composition uh, analysis uh, of uh, asteroids? It could, assuming you can get time on it. Um, one of the really important things that they built into the Webb was the ability for it to track objects that move in the sky, um, not just stars. And that was a huge fight over 10 years to make sure that it had the ability to do that. They've done some test images uh, with Webb to see that it can see asteroids, but I have not seen any results of actual uh, uh, observations yet. Charlie, go ahead and put the whole grid on. Yeah, might as well. Charlie, I do have a question. Yeah, no. Actually, there's another question. We've got another question from the audience. Hi, brother guy, Norbert Vance, uh, EMU. I, I admire your shirt, by the way. Thank you. Um, you know, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Uh, the Vera Rubin telescope, I was just reading about the, the imaging camera on board and uh, the amount of data that's going to be collecting. Uh, I was struck by the amount of uh, asteroid information that'll probably be gathering. Any interest in uh, or commentary on that? 
Um, absolutely. It's uh, fantastic. We've been looking forward to it. The, uh, the mirrors are made at Arizona at our mirror lab, so we're very familiar with it. Vera Rubin taught at Georgetown University. Of course, she was the one who came up with the idea of dark matter. And she taught at our first, very first Vatican Observatory Summer School in uh, 1986. So she was, uh, was a great friend of the Vatican Observatory. Um, we're having a new summer school this summer. If you wanna know what, what's happening with that, go to our website. The one thing of course that we worry about is the light pollution from the Starlink satellites, which is gonna make reducing the data from the Vera Rubin telescope a bit of an issue, but uh, I'm not directly involved in dealing with that. I'm just merely aware of it, but I don't think there's anybody in the room who's not aware of that in this room at least. I like the other comment pointing out that that warm, cool uh, effect is what gives Michigan its lovely roads during the winter time. <laughs> Though, of course, that's accelerated by having water that gets into the cracks and freezes and thaws. So we we do have another question from the uh, comment section. Um, Chris Rizzo asks, how do the physical properties of the measured asteroid material differ from the physical property properties of volcanic stuff found on Earth? Well, the tuff can be very porous, but it's porous for oh. a very different reason. Um, terrestrial rocks, almost all of them have been processed through heat and pressure that meteorites never see. And as a result, the crystals within them lock together they're a lot tougher, no uh, pun intended. And so they're, they're much physically much stronger than the meteorites. In addition, because the meteorites are generally are undifferentiated, they tend to be denser because they've got that five to 10% of little flux of iron running through them. So it's, uh, you know, even when you look at, it, when, you try, when you come up with the question, why are meteorites rocks? And you ask, well, what makes a rock on earth a rock? It's either heat or water or pressure. And those are three things that most ordinary chondrites have not seen, which is why it's kind of a curious question of, you know, why, why are there meteorites? But there they are. Yep. So I did use the word stuff because I thought it was a uh, typo, but I guess volcanic tough is a Yeah, thing, it's so. a particular kind of meteorite. Yeah, or a kind of rock. And quite quite well known here in Rome because uh, this is a very volcanic area. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we have another. One. Um. The fantastic talk. I was thinking about a grade school experiment i think it was grade school where we put uh larger rocks with pea stones and then with sand kind of mixed up in a matrix and then vibrated it and you watch as the larger rocks kind of counterintuitively would rise to the top and i was thinking about that when you're talking about the temperature fluctuation and how that ice is forming inside the molecules and causing more micro cracks and i was also thinking that's also probably at least on a cosmic timeline probably akin to vibration and that might actually contribute to the compaction that you see that you were um yep scratching. um you get you get better compaction if you can have small things filling the voids around big things and as you size sort them through the vibration you actually wind up with uh, <laughs> a a variation in the amount of it that what you're describing is a, is a technical term it's called the brazil nut effect <laughs> as anyone who's bought a can of uh mixed nuts will realize the brazil nuts always wind up at the top of the can so this is a lace potato chip <laughs> brother guy out of the million or so asteroids that you say are now discovered out there, how many or what percentage of them would you say uh, are of this hyper porous type of meteorite? And what implications would that have when it comes to um, planetary defense uh, type of missions? Uh, would, would that have any bearing on it? Would they more, be more difficult to move off course, for example, or to blow up 
with uh, whatever. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, the kind of asteroid you have depends on where in the asteroid belt you are. The asteroids that are closest to Mars, and so the inner side of the belt, are more likely to be actually that that really uh, well crystallized kind that had the interesting lump up and down in their conductivity. You go further out and you get more of the S-type asteroids. As you go towards Jupiter, you get more and more of the C-types. Um, the asteroid populations are roughly 50-50 C-type and uh, S-type with a small number of uh, the other alphabet soup kinds. Of, of asteroids out there. Certainly, if you want to worry about planetary defense, you have to know what kind of material it is. If your idea was to you know, send Bruce Willis out with a bomb and blow up the asteroid, but the asteroid is hyper porous, the bomb isn't going to do anything. Right. It's going to absorb all of that uh, energy and just uh, say, hmm, that was nice, send me another one. <laughs> we kind of had a sense of that when you looked at uh, one of the asteroids that was imaged oh, about 20 years ago, asteroid Matilda, that had like seven or eight huge craters on its surface. And craters of the size that if that had been a solid rock, whatever made that crater would have shattered the asteroid. But it didn't shatter the asteroid. It just punched a, a, a nice hole in the side of the asteroid. In addition, and what that was one of the DART th uh, points of the DART mission, the amount of momentum that you can transfer to an asteroid depends on the way that you impact it. Um, if you've got two balls, one standing still and one hitting, and you have a perfectly elastic collision, you give twice as much momentum to the ball that's been hit than if the one actually sticks and they just you know, share their momentum. This is a physics 101 kind of counterintuitive physics 101 problem. And so you better know what kind of impact you're going to get and how, uh, how elastic that collision is going to be before you can calculate how much energy and how much momentum you have to add to the asteroid to nudge it a little bit out of its orbit. Thank you. All right, I think we'll take we one, one more last one more question. One more one question last. in the audience, and then we've got one more question in yeah, chat. chat. I just wanted to ask, um, I don't know a lot about asteroids, but is there any significant composition difference? Because I've always heard that, oh, inner belt asteroids or uh, inner solar system asteroids are rocky, and then or or cloud and Kuiper belt are comets. But is there any more like specific or larger differences that we've discovered? Yes. Um, and it's complicated. The more we learn, the more we realize that the simple answers that uh, I was taught when I was a student are oversimplified. We know that in the material that comes off comets is stuff that looks like it was very high temperature, not just ice. But certainly the, uh, the minerals that are present and the amount that they've been metamorphosed is very different in the stony meteorites than it is in the carbonaceous asteroids that uh, come from further out. And it has to do with the presence of materials like water that change the minerals that are present, or even the presence of elements like sodium that um, if you have that that can change the composition of the minerals that changes the composition of the uh, the, the rocks that changes the composition of the of the meteor meteorite. So there are gradations in the material present uh, where the amount of uh, iron that is oxidized versus the amount of iron that's iron oxide. If you've got metallic iron, it's a little flux. If it turns into iron oxide, it can be incorporated into the olivine as you know, iron oxide, ma magnesium oxide. And so the mineral changes. And then if you've got really oxidized, then it comes out of the olivine and you've got a magnetite. So these, you know, just adding more and more oxygen as you go further and further out can change the mineral state of the material. Yeah, thank you. That said, it's still easier than terrestrial geology. <laughs> 
And it is. Chris Rizzo says, do meteorites or asteroids show any existence of magnetic field remnants? Yes. And this is very exciting and somewhat controversial. Uh, the argument is, are these magnetic fields that were in the cloud of gas and dust that was making the star? Or are these magnetic fields that were generated inside of a partially differentiated asteroid that, you know, proto-asteroid, not the kind of thing we see now, the kind of thing that was broken up. And therefore, even meteorites that look like they were never differentiated, maybe they're just the top layers of something that was differentiated and had an iron core and had a generating magnetic field. Controversial. But yes, we're finding magnetic remnants. and. Um, it's telling us something we're not quite sure what yet. All right. Thanks. That okay. will do it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm going to go off and go back to bed. But may you have clear skies, though, having grown up in Michigan, I know the odds of that for the wintertime. So at this Take juncture, care. usually offer right, our guests you, brother. A, uh, uh, some kind of a gift. But I know in this case, Brother Guy's not really supposed to accept gifts. However, I don't think there's anything stopping us from making a donation to the Vatican Observatory Foundation. Would anybody object? Thank you very, very much. Can we just call it an indulgence? <laughs> <laughs> Indulge yourself. Here, I think that's underneath the... It is. We can go 200, yeah. To vote, yeah. 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 No okay, we're going to make a $200 donation. Yes. Yes. Proof. Thanks a bunch. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to take off. Bye bye. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Get some sleep. Yeah. Sleep. It's just two forty in the morning for him. So yeah. <laughs> well, he's an astronomer. be used to the yeah. at two forty. Talking about having espresso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Charlie, I'll just mention on H and I on Sunday night is the Star Trek episode with the. Obelisk that deflects the asteroid out of the Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Maramani. With the yeah. Indians? Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if you want to split the meeting, it's 840. Many but I'm going to get to the rest of my quick. Or who's that? that we're not. Okay, but, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. We'll start meeting, so, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. it's late. So right. I'll just jump in the middle. Okay. Nothing. Nothing lowbrow. Well, no, actually, I'll say the big event first and while you're still here. Uh, I was just going to make a deal for guest speakers again. That's just real fast because we have a guest speaker next yeah. month. Oh, uh, everybody's but then we have to make March and April. It could be we're going to have yeah. to call upon it, Adrian. It is, I'll, do it. I'll officially do it. Yeah. Did you see yeah. most of it? Well, yeah. No one else. Uh, I see yeah. about 100 times, but I have to. We need say. to. Uh, I didn't know too many Indians who I've never too many conversations going through wore mini skirt. Right we just started our business meeting. Yeah. What? Yeah. We just jumped right into our business meeting. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll live. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to do I'll do the other the March. Okay. Talk. But again, VPs or anybody for that matter, if you'd like to do something, you know somebody that would like to do something, let us know. We always need guest speakers and we do not have the year filled out, so uh, we got to work on that. But the big thing is, I would like everybody to take a look at the room around you that we have spent quite a few, it's a few years in now, because we're about to leave it. I just earlier today heard from, uh, what is it, Ed, I forget his name, he did a presentation, uh, Ed Edminster, I forget his last name. I can't, I'm gonna screw it up. Anyway, Austin Edminster, Edminster. Anyway, he works at the Detroit Observatory. You might remember he did a presentation for us, kind of a mini one a while yeah. back. And he just emailed me today because they want to now get serious about us moving our meetings over to the Detroit Observatory. Mm -hmm. to which so I haven't had time to answer him yet, but uh, I'm gonna start working on that and see what we can put together. But it looks like uh, the move is going to happen. What comes so, around goes actually. around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're yeah, back here again. Yeah. Well, yeah, one time we met at the Detroit. 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 Back and it was right. many moons ago because I've been around for a long time and that even predated me. Yeah. 
So yeah, like you say, what goes around comes around. We're going to be returning. Back. Back. Like, so I thought that yeah. was pretty exciting. So that now you can go to that. Yeah, is that anything that needs, <laughs> yeah. that anything yeah. that needs yeah. to be loaded on? Or or it it uh, that's uh, not going to happen. No, I don't the open know. house and then so much renovation. Okay, same I'll be back for that. So, like, Oh no, it's right here. It's, oh, it's, 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 it's off. Um, hey, you have anything? Yeah, it's on observatory. Oh, okay. <laughs> you gotta speak up there, or people have to not speak at all yeah. because I'm taking yeah. notes and I can't hear. Yeah, exactly. People are carrying on side conversations. If you need to say something, just the hall's right there. Yeah. Wave your hand at me or something. Well. Or leave. Okay. Yeah. Another conversation. So anyway, Dave. Yes. Yeah, so I had met with um, Susan Westcoff. Um, so the Hands On Museum and the Leslie Science Center are actually administered by the same people. And Susan Westhoff is the executive director of that whole thing. Um, this was originally supposed to be an in-person meeting, but we changed it to a virtual meeting. Um, Susan got sick, but it's neither here nor there. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities of things we could do. I mean, we had a daytime event at the Hands-On Museum a while back. There are things you can do at the Leslie Science Center. Um, partly, I think the club's just got to decide do they want to do that? I can't just say, oh, we're going to do this unless I know at least a few people are going to be willing to do that on a specific day. But I don't know that we got to decide anything right now. And I think it might be better um, when it's warmer. But any of that, we did have that conversation and we can have further conversations with them. Well, actually, Dave, just before the meeting began, Dimitri approached me and uh, mentioned John Dobson, how we used to do the sidewalk astronomy events, asked if we had done that. And as a lot of you know, we used yeah. to do those ever so often. Yeah, Ashley Street. In a of locations, but yeah, right here in Ann Arbor on Ashley Street was one that we did. However, I do remember doing some events where we set up telescopes at the hands-on museum. Yep. I was in the daytime, but we did the sun. So <laughs> I'm thinking that could be like one of our sidewalk astronomy events too, so. Uh, like I'm sure they'd be happy to cooperate with that. So sure. So maybe you and Dimitri can kind of team up and put that together. Sure. Okay. And your timetable will be what May you said? Well, I I have to put I'd like to put posters and stuff together and maybe do some promotional stuff so we can yeah. actually make it an event. Right. But I can I get out of school like the 28th of May. And anything after that, I have nothing but free time. Okay. So basically, we'll be talking June. Yeah, June, late Somewhere May. June, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, why don't you toss that out here, Dave, see if that, that, that would work, Some something in June. Okay. We've done that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that'd be cool. Good old times. <laughs> anything else? Yeah, for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will move to Jeff. Uh, we had a peak of 49 total, which our max on Zoom was 28 and in person was 21. So it's a good meeting. Yeah. Um, been working slowly with uh, Pete Peck too, uh, which is stage left, right, whatever he's over there, uh, about getting our website and WordPress set up. Set up uh, working up. So at the end of the meeting, I'm going to get through some details with him and we should see some movement soon. Cool. And thanks for sending that picture up to me. Yes. <laughs> we haven't done that for a while. You know, it's nothing like a, a picture. I don't know <laughs> what you think of it. <laughs> yeah. Idiots by idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get one for next week. I got next month. Cool. How's that? All right. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, did you want to bring up Emerson School? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we got contacted via Facebook uh, for uh, some kind of event at Emerson School. Let me dig up the um, chat, but the astrology so, event. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Astrology. astrology. Yeah. Jeff did have a discussion with her. Uh, so. That's our mic. Oh. <laughs> sure. 
uh, they want, I think it's April 25th, is what they're looking at. Uh, hang on a second. Oh, when she said April 25th and that 23, and she, she must have met 23 as the year. Yeah. Now yes. that explains it. Okay. It looked funny on Yeah, paper. it does. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sure. That was the comment. Here we go. Uh, yeah, they were basically looking at, they were originally starting at 730, which is like, well, it doesn't get dark until 820. That's sunset. And so now they're looking to move it to around 930. And this is Emerson School, which we've presented there before. Many times, um, actually. Yeah. Long time ago. Um, and Several times. That was April's, Magic Irwin stomping grounds. Yeah, they the mass murderer. Yeah, Nan Arbor. Oh, lovely. Frank I used to cut through my yard. That was even lovelier. <laughs> they do have a a eight inch uh, Mead telescope, which Brian Autumn says is uh, it may or may not work. Yeah. And the observatory is very small, but uh, they're open to us coming out. And I suggested, you know, maybe an hour before things are supposed to start to let us get our, you know, personal scopes set up and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, they're mainly looking for, you know, basically uh, show the stars, show what's out there. Um, anything the that's interesting. Playground. Yeah. Um, what day of the week is that? I believe it's a. Uh, the Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. It's, a, it's a Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. I know I'd like to help. But, but they were talking since days. it has to be later that they'll uh, see if they can't change that to a Friday or Saturday night, which oh. I think they get a lot better. For well, okay, if they did that, then I could probably be there. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, a... She's going to be working with the school to get together okay. some dates on that. Yeah. But uh, I say it's always, you know, if you got clouds, it's some kind of dirty but, and Brian had suggested too that we do it so we bring a few scopes too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I think it actually be critical because otherwise it's going to be one person at a time in that little building and they get a bunch of people there, it could get unpleasant. So yeah. if we had a few scopes set up outside, that'd be great. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, that, there's no reason to do it unless we bring scopes. Yeah. So we have to plan on, you know, four or five of us at least doing that. Um the other thing I wanted to bring up about it, gosh, it escapes me now, but um, Brian Autumn pointed out that Emily Kwan organized our last uh, session out there that we did during the day with solar observing. Mm -hmm. And uh, is she involved in this at all? I mean, I don't. As far as we know, she doesn't know about it. Yeah, I think yeah. getting yeah. her. Uh, involved with it because Brian's pretty sure that she's the one that is in charge of setting up stuff like this. Right. Um, the other thing is the evening sessions we've done out there in the past have been in the fall. Uh, generally mid October to early November because it gets dark early. Right. And we could be out there with the scopes uh, for quite a while before, you know, gets me to go to bed. Uh, it's a long way from now, a long way from April, but you know, it doesn't. The sun doesn't set until what eight thirty? Yeah, eight twenty-seven. Yeah, I looked it up. Then it's not going to get really dark until after ten o'clock, and. You know, now we're talking a yeah, session that goes on till 11 or midnight. Uh, so, you know, and worse yet, we may not have any planets to look at to punch through early. Yeah, looking that up. Yeah. yeah. That's so, true. there's yeah. a lot of things to think about, but true. Yeah, doing it on the weekend is going to be crucial because I don't think it will work. Uh, Good point. Okay. So it sounds like we're going to do it, and uh, we'll work out. I'll come up with some kind of that. Thank you, Jeff. And let's go to Jim. Oh, okay. Well, a um, couple of things. Um, I sent out uh, an email. Let's see, when did I send it out? Earlier in the week, anyway. Yeah. Um, oh, last Friday. Okay, so you've all had a chance to look at this. And 
I'll do the open houses, open house uh, first. Has anybody got any comments on the schedule? Um, I think do I want to do March open houses, or do we want to uh, try and do a um, Messy Marathon out at Lake Hudson. We haven't been out there for like five years or more. Um, the score at Lake Hudson is 20.49. So it's yeah. border, it's borderline border five now. Yeah, well, for Messy Marathon, that's fine. It'll be fine. Yeah, it's a bright obvious. And, um, yeah, the last time we uh, we were out there, we we made Audie Hathod. Uh, he's become one of our most active astrophotographers. Um, so it definitely, just to meet him and have him be a member of the club, it was it was going out there. But you know, Lake Hudson is about eighty minutes from Ann Arbor, and uh, Beach Mountains 25. So that's something I wanted people to consider. And the other thing was uh, one of the nights in June is like first quarter. Um, so for the public, the moon is just fine. It limits the brightness of the objects we can show the public. Right. But the I they could look at the moon too. I mean, like well, yeah, the moon's yeah. pretty popular with folks. There's yeah. no reason not to, to do that. Yeah. The only reason not to do it is will the members show up and make the night happen? That's always been the question with bright moon nights. Why we don't do them? But if the people here, especially people that are interested in open houses at Peach Mountain. How many people here are interested in open houses at Peach Mountain? Okay, that's a, so if you guys actually show up, these things work really well. And uh, I'm happy to do them most any night that you can think of, but these are the Saturday nights that bracket the new moon. And um, we should come to a decision pretty quickly on what we want to do in March. The primary night for Messi Marathon this year is the 18th. The secondary is March 25th. Uh, so what do people want to do? Or should the officers just make a decision and stick you all with it? Well, see, I'm, I'm one of the votes to say, well, let's use the 18th as the Messi Marathon night um, just because of how much harder it will be to get some yeah. the earlier objects before the Pleiades. I think M76 and one of the galaxies really disappears if we wait long enough. Yeah, M74 and 31 and all that stuff disappear pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, the uh, that would have to be at Lake Hudson, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's where we yes. do it. Unless you are going to come drive two and a half hours and try it at one of the <laughs> spots I image from, which is a couple yeah. of shades darker, but I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, I think most of us want to be able to Hudson? drive. Well, Lake Hudson is down here. It's south of Jackson near yeah. the... Uh, I love that hand. Yeah, you all aren't going to see my hand, but most, I think, that are have been with the club for a while know where Lake Hudson is. Down. There it is. It's south of Jackson that's near the Ohio State line. <laughs> Right on the border, almost. Yeah, yeah. It's maybe thirty minutes yeah. from Toledo. The old dinosaur museum. It's the beach It's mountain. about fifteen it's miles north of. Uh, it, it was a tourist area at one point, but it pretty much disintegrated. So uh, we're going to go much messier mess on the eighteenth, then. I don't see any objection. Be a little chilly still. Can I ask a quick question? Um, do you want me to like do posters and advertise, not like actively, ad, but hang a couple posters around the high school? Would you want me to do that? Because I'm fine either way. For the open houses, sure. For the open yeah, houses. Yeah. That's not going to hurt us at all. If yeah. you bring in Belleville 
You bring in Belleville yeah. High. We'd love to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they call we'd her. love to have you come up, and we'd love to put you in front of them. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's not too far for for Belleville. It's about an hour and ten minutes for them to get to Lake. If they go to Lake Hudson, if they go to Peach Mountain, of course, it's like thirty. Well, I don't go to Belleville, but I'd rather not say it on where it's going to be public for everyone. The high school. No. <laughs> well, by then, would you be able to fly them there? Would you? Have to <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Uh, I would also suggest that if we're going to do the marathon on the 18th and we get clouded out, that we leave the 25th open um, as the backup and just start our open houses in April. That's not a bad idea. Because really, chances are kind of against us in March anyway. We might need both of those to have a decent shot at it. Okay. Or some well, see, we've had a we've had a rash of cloudiness that's been worse than even last year around this time. I got out to image maybe seven, eight, nine times in between December and January. I've gotten out three. Last it's year was that that. more than most. Yeah, it, I've had to read and get lucky. I've gotten the two two of the times I was out, I got lucky. So nice, you know that's. The forecast said the lower clouds were coming, but where I went, the whole sky opened. So it, But you drove quite a way. Yeah, you yeah, drive quite a ways to do it because it was actually cloudy to the south. So yeah, we've we've seen a lot of cloud cover. Don't know how well it'll continue into March. Hopefully it eases up by right then. <laughs> yeah. Motion to approve the open house schedule as presented. Uh, second. Okay. Anybody opposed? Didn't think so. Okay. So it shall be. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Well, there's the next more. Next more. The next next more. more. Um, along those lines, a um, uh, week or so ago, the, anyways, the last uh, candidate for a clear Saturday night, which well, it was last weekend or the weekend before, I got a, a an email about <clears throat> a little over an hour before sunset, wondering whether I was going to open that night. And the answer was no, um, for a number of reasons. But mainly, especially with the winter, it takes some time for at least this old observer to to get himself together to to do a session on it each morning. Um, but as far as the rest of the year goes, when the weather warms up, I'm happy to open or figure out a way to open most any clear night. Um, we did that a lot last summer. Sometimes we, a couple of nights we observed from Leslie Park at Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. but we probably opened Peach Mountain to the members 15 or 20 nights last summer. We had a lot of, a lot of clear nights. It's pretty oh, successful. Um, yeah. But if you want to do something, don't wait till you know it's going to be clear. If you know you want to be out there and it might be clear, you know, start it on it a week ahead of time, you know, at least by Wednesday. Um, yes, I, I was going to ask if you had an impromptu idea for the comet observing at the end of the month by chance, if it happens to clear mm -hmm. off. Because we have Adrian posed a question to Shannon Murphy and I if we were going to have uh, Angel Hall and or Scherzer open bright lights in the city. But yeah. uh, if I could, bright lights in the moon too. The, so the EMU Astronomy Club will be up there and clear Monday nights starting this Monday, the 23rd. And on February 6th, which is just past the bright, brightest the part. Tom, it'll be bright enough to see through instruments at yeah. Scherzer. Yeah. And I so, think that, uh, you know, unless people really want to observe from Beach Mountain, that's probably the best thing to do is if people are interested in the comet. Is, so it's, it's best approach will be uh, right around between January 30th to uh, February 5th. Worth or so, right in there. What part of the sky? It's going to pass on on January 30th. It's going to literally pass on the line between W. Mirac, Polaris, 
I mean, it's going to be, it's really booking along at a pretty good clip uh, over the, that week. But, uh, on the 30th, it's literally right on the sign, uh, on the line to, uh, so it's an easy binocular find. You're talking northeast? Yeah. Sky? Well, see, there you go. Because Scherzer, Scherzer is closer to the eastern horizon. Yeah, right. Are you saying? Yeah. And we're 100 feet higher. Exactly. There you go. I mean, for January, are you going to have any public <laughs> viewing this at Scherzer? It's a 10 inch refractor, plus we've got other. Are you going to have any public yeah. viewings? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The door's open for the public. But, right. And I don't know what Angel Hall, they don't, I don't know what Shannon, she didn't say that they had anything planned, I don't think. Right. They just have their normal, they just have their normal open houses. But my Less, question to you, you have is if it's, open, if it's clear out there, with, like you have a scope or two set up for that? Or? Well, if it's if it's clear, I'd rather people go to Scherzer, but, oh. um, you know. Well, people are expecting about this Saturday big night. comet from the headlines mm -hmm. I'm seeing there. Yeah, well, that's yeah. not going to happen. No, it's right now, what, about 6'5"? Yeah, it's the, probably yeah. going to be maxing out about that. And yeah, it'll look your photos to be any more if out at Beach Mountain or basically anywhere's 10 minutes west of the city, it'll be pretty obvious about binoculars if you know where to look. Right. And but yeah, if we've got a clear night, uh, of course, it's that's the moon's that night. Yeah, it's, so. It will be, there will be a rising moon. Yeah. The moon, it, uh, that's what, sorry for butting in, but that was what I was going to ask. Um, I'm obviously not as experienced as you guys, but it's a little over about three quarters of the moon Ugh. coming it was, up. Yeah, it'll be bad. And isn't it past full? Can you check and see if it's, I, I thought. Um, I see right now it's, it's waning. Uh, waning. It's, yeah, it's waning, so we're, we're getting a new moon, yeah, but we also have the nebula. In the mm -hmm. sky, mm -hmm. um, it comes back, and around February third, I thought wow. that was a day past full moon. It is. So, but with if your magnitude's at five plus something, you're still going to see it. Anyways, just no. pose the question. It just won't be as spectacular. Uh -huh. Well, so, there's. I don't think this comet will be naked eye. No, no, no. Okay. But. Uh, <laughs> Will be in, like I said, it'll be observable in the binoculars. You know where it is. It'll be February 6th. Yeah, it'll be in the northeast. Because of two days. Sunset, and it'll be. Those two days, you'll have public view. You know, it'll essentially move across the northern sky over the night. Yeah, I don't think it sets now. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's actually circumpolar now. So as soon as it's dark enough, you know, you can basically look for this time all night. Now, it, we think binoculars at minimum to actually catch it. I was able to catch a fuzzy blow on MLK Day um, through Hayes using the Canon 6D. So when I can do that on a wide field shot, that means it's getting bright enough for binoculars, but seeing, seeing it like we saw Neowise no, me and Eddie can't. But those water. dates uh, yeah, at the turn of the month, that's a bright moon. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, a waxing crescent and, you know, heading toward the full moon. So like, it's going to be bright. I don't think it'll be hard to see telescope to Scherzer. Um, we'll find I'm it. sure it'll more. come. You haven't seen the sky the, up there like the Well, I've been up there. there. I've been oh, up there. I know. The light pollution has just gotten so bad. Yeah, but being able to pick out the comet, I'm pretty it's sure. The Six, five. We'll get out. The yeah. comet that can be but another reason I suggest people use Scherzer is because it's a great facility and um, you get to go inside when you get cold. Yeah. Yeah. That's a biggie. You know, in Peach Mountain, you're stuck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And multiple scopes there too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, everybody gets a turn at Scherzer without a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. Next time, is that gonna be Comet ZTF? Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. E three ZTF. There's two, there's two comets. Yeah. ZTF there's another. Now. The ZTF one found in 2022 is the one that is making the news. There's actually a 
2020 comet that's floating around somewhere at lower magnitude. But I haven't looked at it. I can look at yeah, it. That's 10 8, yeah. So, oh. um, telescope. The telescope, the 17 and a half inch telescope. Um, there's new members here. Several years ago, we got um, a kit from Astro Systems, which has all the wood parts of the telescope, uh, um, essentially CNC cut, and you assemble the telescope and put your own optics in it. Um, and for another $2,500, $3,000, you can put motors on it and, and have it be go-to. And we've done all that over the years. And so we have a 17 and a half inch go-to telescope that in the winter resides at uh, Dave Jorgensen's uh, wood shop in Chelsea. And the rest of the years in the observatory, and we use it at open houses or members that are trained on it can you know pull it out on on member nights and and use it uh, as well um, but you know it needs things done to it from time to time and we um, we pulled it out a few weeks ago we came up with a busted uh, encoder the altitude encoder um, and dead uh, on board batteries. These are particularly disturbing because these two things have happened before. And so we've made some adjustments on how we're mounting the altitude encoder. And um, we're hoping for the best on the batteries. If this set goes, I think we're just gonna go right to powering everything through the ground board uh, with the big um, 12 volt, 35 amp hour battery. The encoder mm -hmm. and onboard batteries have been replaced. Those sums are within the officer's discretion to spend up to $250 on, on particular projects. But the other thing that the telescope needs is improved dew control for its finder and the eyepieces uh, that we put in the uh, focuser. Um, we need more money than we might be able to do just with the officers okay, and that's why we're discussing it tonight. It could cost as much as $550. It could cost a lot less. What kind of finder do you need? Or does it well, we're talking about the optical finder. Uh, there's a 70 millimeter optical finder on the yeah. telescope. And it does over as soon as you pull the caps off. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, and we had, we made <laughs> some low brow straps for it. That, <laughs> It didn't quite work uh, as we had hoped. And so uh, we want to get some commercial uh, Lee put together ones. And those aren't cheap. To, you know, there might be less expensive, equally efficient straps from people we don't know about. and But the people we do know about, Kendrick Systems, um, They've been making these for decades, and uh, and I've had them on my telescope, so they work very well. Um, they usually work through a controller, and that would be about half of this expense. But we're not clear on whether we actually need the controller, so we might not be spending all the money we're asking for. But the straps run from like. $50 to $80 a piece. So, how many do you need? Well, I think three. Mm -hmm. Some of us think four. So, you know, well, one for the that. objective on the finder, one for the eyepiece on the finder, one for the eyepiece on the telescope. Um, yeah. And those cost varying amounts. Um, 
the uh, if we can turn the electronics, the electrical we have in the upper cage into something that will power those straps um, efficiently without bringing up so much power from the, those onboard batteries that they just drain, um, then that's what we'll try to do. We don't, if we don't have to buy a controller, we will. So. There's also AstroZap, which I believe is what I, I use for. Now, in all fairness, my finder anti-doers are homemade using um, the wire rope, the night, yeah. Jim, I'll talk to you about it. I got, I might have some spare stuff. Oh, okay. Well, if we don't have to spend any money at all, that's <laughs> good. But, but, uh, uh, but a strap of, that's why okay. I first, first, and then I'll say, I would propose to approve the yeah. expense, and then if we're able to not use it all, yeah, that's better. So than, it's really like a budget oh, work. Yeah. Second. Our so yeah, okay. our we're our current our current the current system on there, you you can you can just buy one of the IP straps off the shelf for for about sixty bucks, and that takes care of your IPs. Yeah, and yeah that's you, pretty, using that's everything that's already there. I have one of the app distributors, and uh, fair warning to all of you, I'm a cheap bastard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, so and everything. Probably I, why we you fit in to begin with. Yeah. Because he found a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But like uh, lowbrow. <laughs> but yeah, that's why we're lowbrows. That's why we're lowbrows. We yep. try this stuff out, you know, so that we believe in duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it'll to make controllers too out of cheap. Yeah. I, I made one for six bucks. Yeah. Uh, Amazon. Sure. The. I'm sure you can, but I know I can't. <laughs> so I'm happy if you if you want to if you are willing you know, to make the controller. I mean, that's a discussion. It'll be taken outside, but if you yeah. want to jump in to oh, if you want, if cheap is what you want. Well, <laughs> we want work. We, 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 it works. Yeah. Number two is you know saving money, but you know, this is well within the club's financial wheelhouse and we're looking for something that we don't have to worry about uh, at least again in my lifetime yeah uh, the, um, for, the the finders are always always the big problem the because like i say we can for, for, for 50 bucks we can buy something off the shelf yeah. plug it into the current system take care of the eyepiece just fine yeah well, uh, the, the problem that I, I hope. We're talking about powering at least three straps. This also powers the um, dual removal system for the secondary, these onboard batteries, and the uh, dual removal for the uh, Telrad finder on the telescope. Mm -hmm. And so we're asking these four six volt batteries to do all that. And if it's a really bad night, um, you know, if we're just Pouring power into those, full power into those straps. That's what the controller is for. So you only you use as much power as yeah. you need on a particular night, so that your power lasts as long as you need it. Hopefully, so. if you'd like to make a motion, Jim Ken's over there just dying to support it. Oh. <laughs> Adrian made a motion. Yeah, or did I, I make a motion that we support um, up to five fifths? The the uh, budget, I think you called out five hundred fifty, right? Yep. Yeah. I yeah. think we ought to be able to do that. Yep. You know, yeah. the Cadillac of stuff. For I'm that. to raise the budget. We can do it for a lot less. Like somebody wants to build uh -huh. one that works. Yes. Um, more than happy to give that a shot. Yeah. Well, I so my motion will be for the five hundred fifty that's being asked for in order to afford you know, the parts at max cost in order to repair the 17 and a half inch. I second. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. We have a motion in support. Support. All in favor. Aye. 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 Including, okay, including the screens. Is anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 
What, what's the an, annual budget of the club here to have a sense? I'm a new member, so. <laughs> we don't particularly have one. We've, yeah. got, we've got more money than we, we know what to do with, so. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's not enough money to get a 20 inch of planes. So, yeah. Yeah. Start yeah. Yeah. of course, so there's the Aruba slot line, which we haven't tapped yet, so. I have a card that I can swipe for the plane rate. So, okay. but that's a different story that doesn't need to and, be shared. And as, as far as the 17 and a half inch goes, when, when, when you build something like that, any kind of system, it's a system, okay? Um, you have to look at, you, you've got yearly PM, mm -hmm. preventative maintenance. Yep. You have, when you know what happens, which, which occurs from time happened. to time. Well, that's what's happening now. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's happening now. So um, it's what, five years old, six years old? No, we yeah. finished it in 2013, and it was yeah. first 2013. 20, yeah. 14. We if, had it if, after, if, you look, if you look at the money per year that's been spent on that, it's like zero. Yeah, zero. You, can't, you can't see it. So. Yeah, when you spread it out, true. Which if, if we were truly responsible when we built it, we would have said it's going to cost us this much a year to keep maintaining it. Yeah. Some of that's yeah. just, yeah. we didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> we just no. wanted a 17 and a half inch telescope. Yeah, the optics, <laughs> for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, the optics were donated and Jack and me, Doug, Doug Tom. and Tom, uh, yeah, we did the optics. Yeah, uh, Tom took Ryan. a rotten mirror and turned it into a really decent mirror. Yeah, well, it's an okay mirror now. It was a it was a totally POS. <laughs> well, and now it's it's acceptable. I have looked. It, it's more than acceptable. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good. got some good images out of it. Good view. Yeah, you know, I, I <laughs> yeah, we've carried it to Around dark there. skies, high bordel two, low bordel one. We've carried the 17 and a half inch and we've seen a number of things uh -huh. through it. Um, you know, things that you, of course, the, the portal scale helps, but it's, it's enough aperture to view a number of things mm -hmm. yeah. in the sky yeah. like that. You know, taking it uh, 30 or 40 X per inch, I, I don't think that's a problem with this, with this mirror. Yeah. I, I'll add one other tidbit to mm -hmm. the new issue is that. Um, Harbor Freight has a $49 hot air paint stripper kind of thing. It's a it's a glorified hot oh, air gun, dude. but okay. they work beautifully on those. That's what we plug into because the wall when the batteries give yeah. out and blow hot air yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. You just plug in, get yeah. a couple of the battery packs, and you do one, problems. Yeah. The only thing I've the ones like that that I've used in the past, they you know, they say plug into your car, right? That's what it has, right? It has a 12 volt. It's got the big, they say big battery pack. Have your yeah, really really big battery pack or have your car run. It lasts all yeah. night. <laughs> it lasts all night and does the job real quick. Uh, and I know I know on mine, on mine, and we can yeah. and we can we can ask Doug the other Doug. Um, because he he has the same setup that I have, and I, I got a 17 and a half. He's got a 17 and a half. If if you got the doing on there, I I literally just have a wire rope wrapped around my finder and a, a total of like one watt at each end. That's all. But that will not get rid of dew at two in the morning, and and when the dew is dripping off you oh, you, this does. you turn it on yeah you yeah, turn it on work, yeah. used it many many when times you, when you go yeah that it will does, yeah does the job but it will come back I'm using but, an 18 inch top like mine with real low wattage yeah when you take the scope out take the caps off you get ready to go you turn it on and you just leave it on for the night and it's it's taken between my between the eyepiece and finders i'm using like uh so is that three watts dollars included the battery and charger yep uh, yeah, it comes with the kit. I think it's. I, I saw it at Harbor. Okay, it's fine. So speaking of the other Doug, our treasurer Doug Slovo was not able to attend tonight, but he did send an email to the officers to report that we have money and we have members. I'm sure he's <laughs> going to send out something more detailed for the sake of the minutes. What? I can say though that we the last number I knew we were just under 200 members. And correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we had something like. 
pretty close to around ten thousand dollars in the we're, bank. We were sitting around ten grand. Yeah, that's what I thought it was about ten grand, ten something. And, around, if, we, so. and if we're starting a, new to be a membership renewal, yeah. that'll kind of come back. Now we're gonna we're gonna spend some money, but in the grand scheme of things, we had ten grand, five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna make that back up with yeah. a bunch of new memberships. Yep. Okay, Jack. Well, I was I've been out to the observatory again, and everything looks good. Uh, actually, there's nothing really to report on the observatory right now. So, other than we're getting ready to, you know, as uh, Jim talked about, work on a 17 and a half inch top. And when we're done with that, we'll bring it back out to the observatory. That'll be in that March, April time. Uh, hopefully we'll have all the work done on it by February, March. So it's ready for the uh, marathon, Missy Marathon, and ready for the open houses. But other than that, uh, everything's been quite well. Nothing, Nothing's happened out there yet, thank God. And I've seen our Zoom audience, we have our newsletter editor for our fabulous newsletter. Amy, anything to report? No, no, all set, Charlie. Great. Okay. <laughs> Very good newsletter. So only Just other thing. It. And only Adrian, other... you're up anyway. Yeah. Um, let's see. Tony and Mitri are candidates to learn to McMath. I would put you guys up and You've already seen the video that we did, and basically we go yeah. through that. I think, um, you know, the some of the imaging possibilities. I'm curious to see what you guys come up with. As long as the viewing, we we observe through it, and then if there's yes, we'd like to we'd well. like to make it very very crystal clear, like clearest glass you've ever seen, that we are not. Taking it over, we are doing this as yeah, a mission. We, we no, yeah, we would we would have you all learn turning on the McMath and personally. Using... I like old telescopes. <laughs> it's I have a big collection of them. There's, I just want to learn about the telescope. Yeah, yeah. there is a that's manual my, there. That's my perspective, and uh, that describes some of the things you have to do because uh, there's just a list of things that have to be followed in, when you're opening and closing the observatory. Sure. And some other things that are have to deal with <laughs> other telescopes like the 17 and a half mm -hmm. and that, and uh, opening and closing the observatory and working with the people that are doing the, um, oh, the open house and you bring out the, uh, Orange pods and oh, yeah. oh, it's the cones yeah. and stuff. You know, we, we usually open it up so they could take those out, make sure they can bring them back. There's just other things you're doing there too, more than just uh, rolling the roof back, so yeah. so to speak. We can always use more McMath operators. Yeah, this would so. be a, we could use more McMath operators and we could use more open house coordinators. We will be yeah. happy yeah. to train yeah. for either of those. Those are some important roles because. Jim is getting yeah. tired of being the only open house coordinator. No, right. Plus, we're going to be sending these uh, these dates out to the observer, which means people are going to show up and yeah. it's clear on these Saturday nights. That's right. right. So those of you who raised your hand earlier, <laughs> I know who you are, and I know. And the meeting you. was recorded. <laughs> yeah. Still recorded. That's right. Yeah. And then finally, um, if we have a list of dates that are open, um, I'm looking to use my connections to a couple of folks who might be interesting speakers for us. Scott, um, head of uh, Explore Scientific, Scott oh, Roberts, cool. David Eicher, executive. Um, we had to pay him the last. We should time. see if we can get David Levy to come okay. back. That I have access to David Levy. Okay, um, yeah. And there's another. They Astronomy Magazine. So editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine, David Eicher. Um, they recently announced someone that I, that we met, um, or or maybe I did, who was at Okie Text, 
Uh, Molly Wakeling is an up and coming astrophotographer who's won some awards and is now a contributor to Astronomy Magazine. She's a new contributor for. Um, it was just, uh, just saw that. Yeah. And so uh, she's trying to get her PhD in um, Dayton and um, may be able to get her to come along too or to give a talk. And there are a couple of folks from the Southern Hemisphere that I can. Yeah, those guys are pretty people. interesting. Having them would be great. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah got that'd be three, refreshing. Yeah, I've got three such folks to ask. One from Brazil, Dr. Marcello Souza. Um, this would be an interesting talk. Wait a minute. When we do that, does the screen turn upside down? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, we, we can cover it. We'll turn you upside down. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, um, Cesar Brolo is, um, I forget where, I think he's Buenos Aires. And then Maxi. We all saw Maxi, if you were at a couple of years ago, the online astronomy at the beach, we actually brought Maxi in to show Southern Hemisphere targets in a live, in a live view. So things like you haven't heard of 47 Tucana or well, of course, Omega Centauri and the tarantula, they image those a lot. Um, you know, and then you, you all the stuff from the Southern side of the Milky Way, um, you get to see that through their screens. So that reminds me, I wonder, since we have an opening in March, that's probably not too late to consider if Brian would be willing to do one of his sessions to his observatory, because much yeah, beyond that, it's gonna idea. the light's gonna work out. Yeah. But March might not be too late. Does he still have the, the thing in New Mexico though? No, I think he sold that. Did he really? Yeah, no, yeah. he's got that. privileges down there. He's so yeah. he's got outreach privileges or something like that. Huh. Yeah. That was part of the sale was he would still have access. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'd have to ask him. Yeah, yeah. I'll make a note of that. I know he. He's recently been traveling. He did some outreach in Florida recently. I think he was, was actually paid to go to Florida to mm. Ritz Carlton and do some mm. outreach for a group down there. So he's getting miles from his camp. Mm. Uh, Charlie, Charlie, what dates do we have open for speakers? Uh, Just hang a second. I can get the uh, schedule up. Right now, March. You want the actual date itself? No, just a month. Okay, March, April. 20th. I want the date. And then August, right on through the end of the year. Okay, I'm pretty sure I can get Don Olson to uh, do a presentation for us. Okay, you want the dates too. Are you, do you have some? I'm going to write them down right now. Okay, okay. March 17, April 21st, huh? August 18th, September 15th. October twentieth. I got a. Uh, I'm um, I'm a teacher, and one of my students has a parent working on something. I want to talk to her and see if she can come in. Okay, cool. Yeah. So past September, I won't see her anymore. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> then I won't go off the other one. So all right. Yeah, that's cool. No. I'm doing great. Anybody going to NEF, the Northeast Astronomy Forum, which is a big telescope event I'm in being... April? I've been told to go to that. I am going to that, I actually. Okay. I'm Kevin Daney, Joe Brousseau, myself, well, uh, a lot, lot of our fish lake regular. Better. We're going to go to Neef this year. Where is it? I haven't it's, been there in a couple of years. It's at the, uh, the Rockland yeah. uh, Community yeah. College just out in Suffolk, New York. Yeah. And yeah. it's got rock stars and colors. Yeah, it's got it is. It's, it's so an I astonishing know. event. It's sort of like the uh, computer, the, 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 event show in Las Vegas with all the consumer electronics. Yeah. Mm. It's that that kind of forum for telescopes. And so yeah. all the big vendors are there. So two days get, ahead of it is the big astrophotography thing yeah. and then yeah. the regular need goes. But I would just go, it might just be easier for me to go to the mm. regular need. So I'll probably talk to you about figuring out if we want to. So, so uh, beyond September 15th, uh, are we booked? No. Okay, from September we, to the end of the year, we'll open. Open for the rest of the year. Thank you. Yep. I'm just curious about me. Yeah, yeah. I am. Bring I'm your credit card. Yeah. 
No, no, that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Oh, come on. Uh, North just, of, uh, northwest of downtown New York City. Uh, it's in the suburban New York City. Oh, okay, I didn't run. Okay. One thing wow. for he disappears. John Wallbank, you were supposed to be here tonight to pick up your handbook. Uh, 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 demure. I will I will meet you in a, at a future meeting to pick up the handbook. I was unable to get there this evening. Well, let me know ahead of time when you expect to be here. So oh. I because I'm not going to be dragging this stuff to every meeting. No, uh, I will, or, or I'll make alternative arrangements. I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Does anybody have anything else? Well, Charlie, I, I just wanted to mention regarding the uh, Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs, we had our January meeting, and uh, fortunately, uh, Jeff Kopmanis uh, has agreed to continue as secretary, which is uh, the kind of really the heartbeat of the organization. Um, we have uh, a new president and vice president, Tim Campbell of the Ford uh, Club is president, uh, William Finn the Ford Club is vice president. They have both been very active in the club. Uh, uh, Adrian has agreed to continue as president and Brian Autumn will continue as our communications director. Um, Bill, Bill Slagoras Sl Sl is going to continue on the planning committee. I will continue on the planning committee. I am hoping that Harry Anderson will continue also on the planning committee. Our dates for um, this year are going to be sep September uh, 22nd and 23rd, I believe, on Saturday, uh, if people would keep those dates in mind. And uh, and again, we are always uh, eager to have participants who have something to add to the event, some uh, uh, who can participate in some way. And uh, the lowbrows, fortunately, have been instrumental in keeping this organization going and that's something that we uh can and that's another star that we can put on our crown yay so, lowbrows yay lowbrows yes but we have you know and again the ford club has been very good oakland has been very good um Warren. they're increasing interest and uh we we have a good organization so thank you thanks yes can we set up a whatsapp group for communication Say it again. Can we set up a chat group like on the phone rather than through the email? Oh, you, like a WhatsApp like a text message. Oh, like a, text a WhatsApp, message yeah, group. yeah. Uh, hmm. Very handy. Write it down. Check it out. Yeah, we'll have to research that. Mm -hmm. WhatsApp is easier to communicate, and then especially when it's like a Peach Mountain, uh, you know, or right. open house, it's immediate, yeah. you know. Well, usually there's an email. Yeah, that's true. That's an idea, Adrian. Yeah. So it seems like email. I'm not always checking my email. I don't have access to it. Well, WhatsApp is. is uh, well, I know you got to have everybody sign up for it. It's not like yeah, open ended, yeah. but WhatsApp is, is downloading. It's an app. Yeah, it's. Oh, I think it's a little more secure than just regular yeah. text. It's it's like text, text yeah. Yeah. Do we really need to be worried? Yeah. 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 I don't think security yeah. is of much concern yeah. to an astronomy club. Well, oh, that, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. No, there's not much yeah. difference. I mean, you know, somebody asked me. Just you really can be an astronomer, and you can just add the names for like astrologers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's active in astrology. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we're going to see like you have any zodiac signs. <laughs> I did when we did um when we did the uh what was it called yeah. the, a camping event um some what, of the young, I have multiple groups in Birch Shirley. Oh, well, we yeah. used to do Camp Birch Shirley, so some of the young campers would come out, and I'd go, "What's your sign, Scorpio? That's your sign right there." Yeah, that sometimes captured a lot of attention. If you could point out the actual like Libra, there'd be a couple stars of Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius. It would it made it interesting from an astronomy standpoint. Yeah, but I think it's funny to add on to that is a lot of like I know a lot of people in my school they. A lot of them, I'm not going to say which demographic, but you can imagine constantly talk about astrology and their sign, but have never like been outside at night. Yeah. It's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. 
stroke. Well, there's stroke. Fine. There's people on Instagram to tell you. Well, and the interesting thing, I have my wife's uh, former business partners and friends are like big into astrology. I only use the page because they'll start out the moon is in Aquarius or the sun is in something. And then I just look at this and go, okay, that's interesting. The rest of it, I generally don't read, but right. the uh, locations of planets and constellations become something of an observing target. So it's like, yeah, I use these so that I can come up with new ideas for observing target. So the rest of that stuff I don't worry Speaking about. of which, and this is particularly true for like new math operators, something you have to be cautious of is we have you know an open house going, it's pretty busy. A lot of people want to look through the map, math. And somebody comes up here, can you locate my star that my boyfriend bought for me? Uh -huh. Just say, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> because all they're gonna see is a little point of light that means nothing. But the thing is you're hang up everybody else behind them, trying to find this thing that's pretty useless to look at. Has that actually so, happened? Oh, yes. Oh, it's yeah. happened many times. So, Bob yeah. Rustin set me up years ago, and he, he, nor he said, Nora, can you find this star? We were one of the big Kensington events. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, I want to look at this star. And he says, no, go ahead and look. And he says, it's for one of these, uh, somebody bought a star. And I'm like, oh, yes. some idiot bought the, the yeah. couple was standing right behind me. <laughs> 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 I like to spend I 70 bucks on the star. I did tell somebody and then realized you just got ripped off, don't you? Yeah. Right. Just Frank, a few minutes. What was your yeah. suggestion about announcements to the club? To, use, to have a, a group oh, yeah. chat group on WhatsApp. What's oh, yeah. Yeah. services. Yeah. That's pretty. I, I got it written down as uh, to, to look into. Uh, for yeah. uh, next month. There may be some value to it, especially for newer members. Um, old old guys. You, you can post really photographs and mm -hmm. pictures. And Emails. And and yeah, I, I, we just put this in there yeah. on the phone, but yeah. you know, it, it's, it's worth considering, I think, even if we, yeah. as long as we, you know, we would actually consider it. And I know Jeff, you're on the, you're already on the case, so. Yeah. So oh, I am picking up the uh, gift card for the keynote speaker oh, tonight. Thank you. For yeah, we're we're picking up a gift card and mailing it to the keynote speaker at Astronomy at the Beach. Um, and she she agreed to like a fifty dollar gift card. So we're gonna we're gonna spend the Astronomy at the Beach funds. Which so we've got a few months, but when we know we're gonna be coming in for the donations. To astronomy at the beach so that we can you know we're back to in-person events and the in-person footprint is going to grow um yeah so they're going to be more costs yeah, Nicole, right. yeah, Nicole's yeah. The cold zone yeah the cold zone i didn't see the second talk but i got to see the first one yeah yeah, yeah. actually we've had her before so yeah she's good but you know okay you're, you're forgetting something that star name registry that's recorded in tabular form at the yeah. U.S. Patent Office. That's right. Whatever that means. <laughs> exactly. I know. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's basement <laughs> makes it sound. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's got sentimental value to the people. So sometimes it's. You know, I had somebody buy a star and tell me to take an image with the star in it. And I gave them a picture of the Big Dipper over the Mackinac Bridge and said, your star is over here. Yeah. He kept yeah. that image. It, it meant something to him yeah. So, yeah. You know, for his deceased wife. So some, it's, it, you, you tread lightly. Yeah, not you know. an appropriate thing for an open house. So, you know. Know. So, yeah. yeah. Somebody bought me a star, but it's in Southern Centaurus, so I'll never see it. <laughs> that can well, be out of it. I'll, be, I'll have Maxi look well, you know, for there, it. Since there's no, yeah. since there's real no, I wonder how much money they're making. It reminds me of like on the internet, this guy did a thing where we should like, start from yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. It's a money making pixel for a dollar. So By the way, most you need to really yours. Yeah, that's a good idea. Third. 
We have a motion to adjourn. Anybody opposed? Okay, thank you very much. From me, guys, all right. I am going to risk how many times we sell the same star. Check it. You're welcome.